was a crowd gathered round all over town. They come to see what it was all about. There was a sound came down from the upper room where the Holy Ghost was being poured out. It sounded like the sound of a mighty wind fell on every one of them. Thank God the wind of Pentecost keeps blowing again. The wind is blowing again. The wind is blowing again. Just like the day of Pentecost, the wind is blowing again. Oh, the wind is blowing again. The wind is blowing again. Just like the day of Pentecost. That God is blowing through the world today Like the prophet Joel said it would do For Peter said on the day of Pentecost It's for you and your children too Well open up your heart, let the wind blow in You'll never be the same again Thank God the wind of Pentecost Is blowing again The wind is blowing again Just like the day of Pentecost, the wind is blowing again. The wind is blowing again. The wind is blowing again. Just like the day of Pentecost, the wind is blowing again. Just like the day of Pentecost, the wind is blowing again.
Praise the Lord for that Holy Spirit this morning that's with us right now. We're going to do one more song, and it's just for y'all to worship to, sing along if you know it. It's an older, older, older song, and we just want to keep welcoming in the Holy Spirit this morning. And this song comes straight from Philippians 4.13, says, 
I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But sometimes I wonder what he can do through me. The strength and no glory to show, no power of my own. In my weakness, he's there to let me know. His strength is perfect when our strength is gone. He'll carry us when we can't carry on. Raised in his power, the weak. Become strong. His strength is perfect. His strength is perfect. Now we can only know the power that He holds till we truly see how deep our weakness goes. His strength in us begins where ours comes to an end. He hears our humble cry and proves again. His strength is perfect when our strength is gone. He'll carry us when we can. Carry on, raised in his power, though we become strong. His strength is perfect, his strength is God bless you this morning. God bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Come on, brother. In just a couple of words, for the sake of time, I want to ask you a question, and I, I want you to think about it. And I, I would, if you'd like to, I want you to respond. What does it mean to be free in Christ? In your opinion, your your view. What does it mean to be free in Christ? In just a couple instances where Jesus says, When the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. We're free in Christ. What's what's that mean to you? Not everybody at once. Hang on. Hang on. Let's go one at a time. One at a time. Trevor, that's probably a good idea. Raise our hands so everybody don't talk over each other. Silence is deafening. Okay, I said a couple of words. I don't need... Okay, okay, go. Okay, pretty good. wasn't that short, but it's pretty good. Uh, anybody else? What does it mean to be free in Christ? Anybody else got an opinion on it? Yeah. 
Good job. That's good. What, what are we... So we're, we're free from the bondage of sin, but what, does he set, what did He set us free from? Landon, what did He set us free from? Okay. What did He set us free from? Okay, true. I mean, a lot of, none of these answers are wrong, but what did He ultimately set us free from? What was the schoolmaster that drove us to Christ? God. We're, huh? The law. That's what He set us free from, the law. He set us free from the law that was given for, to, to God's people. It was a schoolmaster that led us to Christ. The law never could have been upheld. No matter how hard they tried, they still failed. And the, the, so the law was to point out where we was wrong. And when Christ came and we believed in Him and we quote-unquote accepted His work on the cross... Then, and He set us free. He set us free from the law. That's what we were set free from. When, when, when God said to, to, to the Israelite people, uh, don't eat pork. Uh, when He said, uh, don't, don't lie, don't steal, uh, don't do this, don't, bear, uh, don't covet, all these different things. That was the law. And when Christ came, He set us free from that. And as we look into this, this passage today, this church, they had a lot of arguing and a, really a lot of sin going on amongst themselves. And uh, Paul, he, he points out uh, these things that uh, uh, the difference between freedom, just regular out, all out freedom, and what was the purpose of for the freedom. So if you have a Bible, and you should, I'd like to invite you to open it to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, uh, there, like I said, there's a lot of stuff going on in the church at Corinth. They are absolutely uh, going at each other about different things, a lot of, a lot of sins running rampant in this uh, body of believers. And uh, uh, he starts off with one of the things is that they're actually suing each other. They're actually suing each other for stuff. And uh, so Paul starts out in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, verse 1, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining, pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one, who will be able to judge between his brethren? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. He's basically saying this that churches should be able to solve problems amongst themselves. Churches should be able not to sue each other and to argue and carry it out in the world. Let me tell you one of the greatest destructions that you can have as a church. Run out there and tell everybody all the things you don't like about it. And go out there and badmouth it. And tell them how, how you don't like the preacher because he's fat or he preaches too long or you don't like the, the, you know, the, the air's too cold. That was for you, Kachina. You're my friend. 
brought me some monkey bread this morning. I appreciate that. They didn't even eat it all. I got a piece. For you to run out and badmouth the church to other people is destructive to the church. <laughs> and he's saying, listen, if you can't even get along and, and come to conclusions, if, if Shannon is mad at me and he don't like me for something or he, he's got something against me and me and Shannon can't work it out, Shannon goes and gets Tom. You know what that's called? A mediator. And Tom sits down and he goes, all right, Shannon, what's your side of the story? Johnny, what's your side of the story? And he lays it out, and then, and then Tom says, all right, I think Shannon's right. Well, I get mad. And then it says that he goes and gets Charles. And Charles and Tom come, and they sit down, and they go through things. And then he says, if that don't work, you bring it before the church. And then if you bring it before the church, and they still don't listen, you're supposed to kick them out. Listen. I'm tired of apologizing for what God's Word says. I'm tired of it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not apologizing. for If God says it, it's right. Take it up with Him. You don't have to take it up with me. And, but He's saying that we should be able to work things out. But instead, we take it out into the world, and He says it's shame on us. Remember that old shame, shame, shame. Remember that? You know, people used to always say it all the time. He said, it's shame to us. We can't even get past these matters. He says, now therefore, it is already an utter failure for you to go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? You know what he's saying? It's better for you to get done dirty as to take it out into the world. What? What? It's better for you to get cheated than it is to take saved business to lost people. He says, no. You yourselves do wrong and cheat and you do these things to your own Brothers, what a shocking statement that should be for us. That when we do something in church, when we treat somebody bad in church, when we, when we misuse them and mistreat them, it is a... Not only do we do them, but we do them to our own brothers and sisters in Christ. He goes on to say in verse 9, Do you not know... Now, I want you to think about this. He's talking about suing somebody, okay? He's in the, he's in the middle of, a, of a, a statement to these people that they're arguing and suing each other uh, over stuff. If, if I... If I go out in the parking lot and Miss Sherry backs over me. It's going to tear her car up, first of all. Miss Sherry backs over me and, and I say, that's it. I'm, I'm, Sherry, I'm suing you. And I take her to court. That, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about this, this, this lawsuit that seems very minimal in the grand scheme of things. Then he goes on. He gets to a very serious part. He says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. He says, do not be deceived. Don't be tricked. I want to ask a question in here, and I need everybody to pay utmost attention to this question because it's going to require you to raise your hand. Okay? Have you ever, ever told a lie. Some people not want to raise their hand. It's okay, raise your hand. Have you ever told a lie? Alright. If you didn't, you just told your first one. Alright. 
He says, do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. He starts out with, with sin that we would... Th- I mean, boy, the first four, y'all are like, oh yeah, yeah, fornicators, homosexuals, yeah, they ain't going to heaven. He starts off with these very, very uh, openly uh, in your face grotesque sins of fornicators which means basically means sex before marriage this is sex outside of marriage sex before marriage them nor idolaters people who love other gods serve other gods nor adulterers that's a somebody has a relationship outside of a marriage covenant nor homosexuals That one speaks for itself, and nor sodomites. That's somebody who has a relationship with a young person. Most of us in here be like, I'm good with all them. I'm good with all them people not inheriting the kingdom of God. They they terrible. Then he gets in nor thieves. Any, I, I asked anybody ever told a lie. Anybody ever stole anything? Took five dollars out of your mama's purse without asking. Uh, pick, took a piece of gum from somebody when they wasn't locked out of your best friend's locker at school. Have you ever stolen anything in your entire life? All right, that's most. Back to the lie in the first one. So we throw that one in. I would go through these and ask: Are you a Adulterer, are you a fornicator? Are you a homosexual? Are you a sodomite? But you've already admitted that you're a bunch of lying thieves. I don't know why to ask that. Thieves, covetousness. You ever look at something that somebody else has? Boy, I wish I had that. Drunkards or revilers, which is just arguing, get in your face yelling. Somebody, just think, just somebody yelling at you. That's a reviler. He says, None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Look at verse 11. If you don't have this verse highlighted in your Bible, you ought to. It's the most beautiful verse in the scriptures, in, in my opinion. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Woo! You ain't them things no more. Listen, if you've ever looked at a woman or a man and lusted, If you've ever had a relationship outside of marriage, if you had a relationship before marriage, if you've stolen something or told a lie or yelled at somebody, all those things, he said you were that. You're no longer that because you've been washed in the blood of Christ. You've been cleansed, sanctified, and justified. Here we get into verse 12. You remember what he just said, right? You're not those things no more. You've been washed in the blood of Christ. Listen, in 12, all things are lawful for me. All things are lawful for me. I've been washed in the blood of Christ. There's nothing that can unsave me. People say all the time, you know, they ask, do you really believe in once saved, always saved? I believe if you're really saved, you're always saved. There's nothing I can do to earn his salvation. Ain't nothing I can do to lose it. He says, all things are lawful for me. 
But not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Now, I want you to know this quote, all things lawful for me, was probably going around the church at Corinth like wildfire. Oh, I'm saved. I'm born again. I can just go do what I want to do. If I want to go cheat, I want to go be with this woman or this man, or I want to do this or I want to do that, all things are lawful for me. Paul said, yeah, all things are lawful for you, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for you, but some of them is going to be addicting, and they're going to have power over your life. He says, I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach and stomach for the food. Because they were saying the same thing about uh, trying to keep this worded down a little bit. I know there's some younger people. Uh, because they were saying the same thing that the body was made for intimacy and intimacy was made for the body. Did I do that okay? I said that word that right. Uh, and he says that food for the stomach, the stomach's for food, but God will destroy both, it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by His power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them member, members of a harlot? Certainly not. He gets back this same phrase that he used in Romans. One, two, three, four, five. Certainly not. Ume, ume. He kept saying it over and over again. Shall we continue in sin? Ume, ume. Certainly not. No way, no how. And he goes on to say, Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot, is one body with her. For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. <clears throat> but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee, run from. Listen, people, to what I'm telling you. Run from sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Paul, uh, Paul, he sums all of this up. Right here, he just brings all this to an end. He says, you're right. You're free to do whatever you want to do. But I want you to think about this. You were bought with a price on a cross. You were purchased with the blood of Christ. Therefore, let's glorify God in what we do. There's nothing, you, you can't do nothing to, to lose your salvation apart from saying, I don't want it no more. Well, you can walk away from it like that. I've seen a lot of people do it. Sometimes I wonder if they really were born again. But I'm not the judge. But Paul says, listen, there is liberty in Christ true. We're no longer under the law. True. We are now under the grace of God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And he says, but hey, listen. That, it, it, it's 100% true. But what are we doing when we're not glorifying God? When we go out and play harlot with the world and we marry into things... I don't care what it is. I'm telling you, I've said a lot of times it's easy for us to look through Scripture and we look through and, and we're like, oh, look how awful them bell worshipers were and how these people, how'd they do that? 
And I tell us all the time, look in the mirror. We do the same thing. As a matter of fact, I've said a hundred times that the Baal worshipers, all we did was change the letters around a little bit. Now it's ball worship for us. We worship sports more than we worship God himself. We get more excited about a, a home run or a touchdown or a three-point shot. I've seen some of y'all at the ball games. Y'all out there, oh, ref, that was terrible. Oh, me is the answer to that one. I, I, I'm, I, I'm preaching to myself too. And we're screaming and hollering. And then our team hits a big shot. We're jumping up and we're high-fiving everybody. Yeah, baby, yeah. Did you see that? Oh, yeah, baby. You see that shot? God does something great and we're like, Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. I see y'all's Facebook videos. I see y'all's posts. Heck, a lot of times in our, a lot of, some of our Facebook posts, we're more concerned that a turtle was crossing the road and might get ran over by a car or a dog is, is lost and we're trying to get them found than we are about lost souls. Somebody better say amen to me. Paul says, listen, we bring glory to God when we not just know Him, but live for Him. Serve Him in a way. Listen, flip over with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Just a couple, couple of little verses on over. Little chapters. I'm going to start in verse 23 and I'm going to read through. And I'm going to show you the importance of understanding of, of things being lawful to you. And you think, man... He must have really been on this because he's, do, he's done said it now up to chapter 10 about five times. Chapter 10, verse 23. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Honestly, guys. I want you to sit right where you're at for just a second. And I want you to ask yourself, the decisions that I make and the things that I do, am I more concerned with myself or someone else? I'll just give that in a second to soak in. The decisions that I make, and the things that I do, are they, more ge are they geared more toward pleasing yourself or someone else? I think if we were honest with ourselves, we would all say that most decisions that we make every day is about me. Paul says, gosh, all things are lawful, but they're not helpful. All things are lawful, but they don't edify. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market, asking no questions for conscience' sake. For the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness. If any of those who do not believe invite you to dinner and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you, unless it's pimento cheese. They left that part out. It says, it says you don't have to eat pimento cheese, but does anybody else just say that in their Bible? I got the JWV, Johnny West version. Ha <laughs> ha, boo. Uh, he says, eat whatever is set before you, asking no questions for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, do not eat it. For the sake of the one who told you and for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. Conscience, I say not your own, 
but that of the other. For why is it my liberty? Why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But if I partake with if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food over which I give thanks? Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of, church of God. I'm going to stop right there for just a second and just let you know all of what Paul is saying in a nutshell. He's saying, listen, if you eat meat, eat meat. If you don't, don't. I saw a funny thing on Facebook the other day. It was a girl and she had a big steak in front of her and had a piece of it cut off. And in the caption it said, I caught this animal. Or, hey vegans, I caught this animal eating your grass. I took care of him, you're welcome. As she was taking a big bite of steak. And, and it's funny, you know, I mean, listen. But I don't care if you're a vegan or not. I don't care if you like, if you like meat or you don't. None of that stuff matters to me. None of it. Don't make a hill of beans. If somebody likes meat, let them eat meat. If they don't like meat, let them eat rabbit food. <laughs> Carrots and celery and broccoli and lettuce and kale and what all the other nasty stuff in the world. Even, that's even another one. He's saying, listen. I have the liberty to do what I want. But if me eating a steak offends Shannon who only wants to eat salads with raspberry vinaigrette dressing. When I'm with Shannon, maybe I shouldn't eat a steak that day. That's what he's saying. He's saying, guys, listen. In another passage... If you cause your brother to stumble, you've messed up. He said, Paul, even he, Paul said, he says, I'm a, to the Jews, I'm a Jew. To the Gentiles, I'm a Gentile. To the Republicans, I'm a Republican. To the Democrats, I'm a Republican. I mean, I'm a Democrat. He's saying, if you will be things to all people, the final verse is coming. He says, if you will do this, the reason that I do this, yes, I have liberty to eat steak and bacon and sausage and country ham and pork chops and hamburgers. Hey, I can even eat a hamburger with bacon on it. I'm hungry. <laughs> he says, listen, don't give them any offense to say anything about you. The reason that you should live your liberty out through Christ is, listen to this, verse 33, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Amen. Golly, man, if we started living like that, if we started living that, I want people to seek Christ in me so bad that they will believe in Christ themselves. But you know, we so much, we live out our own freedoms. And sometimes we use it as a crutch. Well, I'm not under the law no more, so it's okay to tell a lie in this instance. I'm not under the law no more, so it's okay for me to look at this woman in lust. I'm not under the law no more, so it's okay for me to jump on this website and surf through. I'm not under the law no more, so it's okay for me to have premarital sex. I'm not under the law no more, so it's okay if I get in somebody's face and yell at them. And I'm a reviler against them. 
No, Paul says, listen, I will not do those things because I will not come under the power of anything. Instead, I will live my life for Christ so that others will come to know Him. Shh. Boy, we, we start living like that, we'll flip this world upside down. So I ask you today, where's your freedom in Christ? Do you care more about your brother? Or do you care more about yourself? Do you care more about your way? Do you care more about your feelings? Or do you care about other people's feelings and other people's desires and other people's uh, growth? Because Paul says, listen, I am free to all things. I can eat what I want. I can say what I want. I can do what I want because I have that freedom through the grace and the blood of Christ Jesus. I was washed. I was justified. I was sanctified. All of those things. I have the freedom, but if they are not helpful, if they do not edify, and if they have power to take control over you, you better not do them. Not because you'll lose your salvation, but because you'll turn other people away from the salvation that Christ offers. You know why people don't want to come to church today? Because they see how we live. I mean... Somebody up at the marina and they're like, well, I mean, I ain't no different Mark Jones. He just cussed somebody out for spilling a beer on his boat. That didn't really happen. I was just making something up. You know, I, why do I want to come to church? Stanley Claywell, he speeds those gravel up in my yard when he's delivering my mail. He's not even putting it in a box. He's just throwing it out getting wet. <laughs> Why do I want to come to church? And I know Ann Gregory goes to church and she's my boss at work and she treats me like a dog. She really don't. The kids, this is all made up stuff, okay? None of this is serious. Stanley really don't throw mail out on the ground. Why do I want to go to church? I went down DT McCall's and Jason ripped me off on a, on a piece of furniture. That's why people don't want to come to church. Because they see how we act and how we treat other people. And they're like, why do I want to go to church? I want no part of that. Makes, sometimes it makes me want to walk out. Where are you at today? Where is your freedom in Christ? It's